Let's uh, start with prayer then. Gracious Lord, we pray your blessings this day upon our study of your word to help us understand it and apply it rightly in our own lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, so we got to finish up from last week yet. So we're in 1 Kings 22 from last week. Verses 41 and following. So we kind of finished the whole story of Ahab. He dies. His blood gets licked up by the dogs, just like God prophesied that it would. Um, and now, now, for a very brief little bit, God looks at the southern kingdom. Um, we, it's going to go right back to the northern kingdom in First King here in Second Kings, but. The end of 1 Kings here, we at least get a little bit about what's happening in Judah, the southern kingdom. So verses 41 to 44, now Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, had become king over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Shilhi. And he walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from them, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Also, Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. All right, so even though he's a godly man, he has two blind spots. He seems to allow these high places, these shrines, to exist. Um, they probably weren't all shrines to false gods. They may, some of them may have been shrines to the true God, but uh, the, the problem, even if it was a shrine to the true God, the problem is in Israel they had a specific place commanded by them to worship, and that was at the temple in Jerusalem. They were not to set up their own individual little places of worship. So it was still contrary to God's will, even if somebody made the argument that these high places were devoted to the true God. They were still wrong uh, and contrary to what God had commanded. Majority of them, I think, probably were to idols, um, like, like uh, Asherah and Baal, which seem to be the two big ones that bother Israel uh, and Judah. So he doesn't take them all down. Uh, that's one strike against him. Uh, and then uh, the other strike is he made peace with Ahab, even though he should have known better. So on the handout from last week, a couple of notes. Uh, the last king of Judah, Asa, was discussed in 1 Kings 15. So all the chapters from there are concerned about the northern kingdom. So we've spent a lot of time talking about the northern kingdom because they were just so messed up and had fallen so far from God that it becomes necessary to chronicle how messed up they are because they are also the first of the two kingdoms to fall. And unlike the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom with its 10 tribes will eventually be erased from history. I mean, they are, they are going to be so thoroughly wiped out, they will cease to exist forever. Whereas the southern kingdom, while it will be sacked and the people carted off into slavery, will rebuild. They'll still exist. Uh, the next note on last week's hand, uh, hand out, uh, compare verse 43 with 2 Chronicles 17. So, nevertheless, he walked in the ways of his father Asa, didn't turn aside from them doing what was right. Nevertheless, the high places were taken away, etc. So look in 2 Chronicles chapter 17. 2 Chronicles actually gives us more details than, than Kings does about this. Uh, the books of, of Chronicles are written to fill in Kings. Kings is specifically just about the Kings, whereas Chronicles chronicles all the issues that were kind of happening around it. So 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 7 to 9. 
So in the third year of his reign, uh, he sent his leaders, Ben Hael, Obadiah, Zechariah, uh, Nathaniel, and Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, uh, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, uh, Azahel, Shemiramoth, wow, there's a good one, uh, Jonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, Tobedonijah, the Levites, and with them Ishma, Ishma, and Jehoram, the priests. So they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them, and they went through all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Now, I mean, this is significant. When Je Jehoshaphat took the reins in the southern kingdom, he orchestrated a program of national theological education and renewal of worship. He sent the priests out. He sent teachers out. He sent the law out. They read it. They taught it. So all he's educating the whole southern kingdom. So it's actually very impressive what he does. Uh, he doesn't just want to believe in God himself. He wants all, all Judah to believe rightly. So he's teaching them doctrine. He's, uh, it's a tremendous thing, really, that he does. A national program of theological education, catechesis. Uh, he's the only king, really, that we're told does something like this. So it's a truly remarkable thing. Uh, all in the handout, then, again. Um, the next note, uh, Second Chronicles 17, 1 to 12, shows God's blessings, uh, that is, both material blessings and in terms of peace, given to him for his faithfulness. So if we read on from where we just quit in Second Chronicles, and the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, so they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents and silver as tribute, and the Arabians brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 male goats. So Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful, and he built a fortress and storage cities in Judah. So kind of, kind of just like with Solomon, uh, God blessing him with material wealth because he had put God first theologically and doctrinally in his life. Uh, so all of Israel is prospering now, almost a, um, a second golden age in Israel. This is back to the days of Solomon and the wealth and the blessings of God. Pastor, yes? That's a lot of livestock. It is a lot of livestock. Well, I mean, Judah was a fairly large area, and it had to be fairly lush in order to support that kind of livestock. I mean, they had, they had plenty of pastures and things to feed him. It was mountainous. Isn't that a desert area right now? I, I, I honestly don't know what the, anybody been to the Holy Land? I don't, I've never been there. I couldn't tell you. Parts certainly are. And the number seven again. Yeah, lots of sevens and that Again, just indicative of the fact that God is the one moving them to do this. So anytime you see sevens, it's the hand of God somehow. Um, staying in Second Chronicles for a bit here, chapter 19, <coughs> verses 1 to 3. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem, and Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king Jehoshaphat, now this is, this is after his alliance with Ahab, after they attacked that city, Ramoth and Gilead, and got their butts handed to them for it. Uh, now Jehoshaphat returns back to Judah, having lost that battle, and Ahab having been killed in the process. So this, is, this picks it up from that point. Verse 2, and Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him and said to, the king, to king Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. All right, so this alliance with Ahab 
gets Jehoshaphat not so much punished as chastised by God. This, you know, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord. Jehoshaphat put biology ahead of faith when it came to the northern kingdom. And his statements to Ahab was, we're brothers, so of course I'm going to help you. You know, biologically, but certainly not theologically anymore. Uh, so he, he should have put God before blood. He didn't. All right, so the wrath of God is upon you. This is not good news for Jehoshaphat, but God cuts him a break because he has been faithful despite this huge blind spot he seems to have. Reading on from there, verses 4 and following, still in Second Chronicles. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim, and he brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. Then he set judges in the land throughout the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed to what you're doing, for you are not to judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. Now therefore let the fear of the Lord God be upon you. Take care and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no partiality nor taking of bribes. Moreover, in Jerusalem, for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies, Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites and priests and some of the chief fathers of Israel when they returned to Jerusalem. Uh, and he commanded them, saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a loyal heart. Whatever case comes to you from your brethren who dwell in their cities, whether of bloodshed or offense against the law or commandments, against the statutes or ordinances, you shall warn them, lest they trespass against the Lord, and the wrath come upon them, uh, a wrath come upon you and your brethren. Do this, and you will not be guilty. And take notice, uh, Amariah the chief priest is over you in all matters of the Lord. And Zebediah the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, for all the king's matters, also the Levites will be officials before you. Uh, behave courageously, and the Lord will be with the good. So a second national program he does. You know, the first one was education. Now it's, now it's uh, reforming the court system. And the instructions he gives to the judges he appoints is rule by God's word. Judge by God's word, not by the wisdom of men. Uh, and then he appoints, kind of as watchmen over the judges, priests and Levites to make sure the judges are, in fact, ruling according to God's word. So, he really, he reforms everything in Judah. Politically, educationally, this, this is really maybe even the highest point in the children of Israel's faithfulness to God. Because he is including all the children of Israel. You know, even David really didn't do something like this. David himself was a faithful man, but I don't, I don't recall David having a national program <laughs> of both education and court reform. It's remarkable. So he understands, Jehoshaphat understands quite rightly, that faith is life. And every aspect of the people's lives is to be guided and ruled by the word of God. So he's, he's very good with that. Maybe the best of all of Israel's kings. Okay, any thoughts from 2 Chronicles? Then back to 1 Kings 22. So even though God chastises him, it doesn't stop Jehoshaphat from picking up where he left off and continuing uh, with doing God's will. He, he took his, he took his uh, scolding, like a man, and went forward and, and accepted that he had not done right. He repented. Verse 45 to 47. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, the might that he showed, how he made war, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And the rest of the perverted persons who remained in the days of his father Asa, he banished from the land. There was then no king in Edom, only a deputy of the king. Okay, on the handout, the mention of his expulsion of perverted persons 
shows how entrenched they were. If you remember, it's been a long time, but Asa, uh, who started a national reform of faith also, Jehoshaphat's father, uh, he also expelled the perverted persons, but evidently he didn't get all of them. And the perverted persons are homosexuals, and they are temple prostitutes. So homosexuality in ancient Israel was present. It was there, even in godly lands like this. And Jehoshaphat removes them. And it doesn't say he killed them. It says he banished them from the land. He chases them out. He gives them a choice, basically, of probably repentance or expulsion. All right. Um, the mention of a deputy in Edom shows Jehoshaphat subdued a conflict. Edom had broken away and elected their own king at one point in time. So Jehoshaphat squashes this rebellion and appoints a loyal government governor in his place. And the subduing of Edom now becomes important for what follows in the rest of Kings. Uh, so verses 49, no, 48. Jehoshaphat made merchant ships to go to Ophir for gold, but they never sailed, for the ships were wrecked at Ezion Gerber. So if you look at the little maps I included, you see the kingdom of Edom is this big yellow blob right underneath the kingdom of Judah on the, on the top map. So it's, it's a big, it's geographically bigger than Judah. But it was controlled by Judah. It's basically a vassal state of Judah. Then if you look at the map underneath that on the left-hand side, you can see this Ezion Gerber place on the very bottom of the map, uh, right on the, the top coastline of the Red Sea. And then on the right map, that's kind of the whole Red Sea you see there. You see the sea. And there's right at the top of that, where it's got Egypt up there, uh, just to the right of where the word Egypt is, is where that Ebion Gerber was. And then Ophir, where they're getting the gold from, is down there in the boot of modern-day Saudi Arabia. So they, used to, they would sail down there, get the gold, and sail back up the Red Sea, and then deliver it uh, to Judah. So he had, he had created this navy for the sake of mining gold in Ophir, but it says that the ships were all wrecked and it never happened. There's a reason for that, which we shall see. Second Chronicles, yeah, there's the reason. So back, back to Second Chronicles again. Second Chronicles chapter 20 this time. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 35 to 37, and that's where we'll see what happened. Verses 35 to 37, chapter 20, 2 Chronicles. So after this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted very wickedly. And he allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Ezion Gerber, but Ezion, uh, Eliezer rather, the son of Dodava of Marisha prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked, so they were not able to go to Tarshish. A Jehoshaphat didn't learn. It's, it's just it's so amazing how, how even a, a person of great faith and piety can have such a blind spot. That's just such a repeated thing throughout the Old Testament. How people of faith can have these blind spots. But they just can't see it. And he, uh, Jehoshaphat, could not understand that he should quit messing around with the northern kingdom. 
They were godless. He just didn't get that he shouldn't have contact with them because of that. So even after the death of Ahab, after he gets scolded by the prophet, he still makes an alliance with Ahaz, Ahab's son who took the throne, who was just as wicked as Ahab was. And then God intervenes, and that alliance they had to both get rich off the gold, uh, he, God put an end to that by destroying all the ships that were going to get him the gold. But he just doesn't learn. It's kind of shocking. Now verse 50, back to 1 Kings 22. And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, uh, his father. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. All right, so uh, we're not given details of how Jehoshaphat died. He took office when he was 35. He reigned for 25 years, so we know he was 60 when he died. So quite elderly. <laughs> yeah, the elderly back then was a little different than elderly now. Yeah, speaking of elderly, did you see pictures of Gene Hackman this week? Couldn't believe it was Gene Hackman. I like Gene Hackman in all his old movies. He's now doesn't look anything like Gene Hackman. He looks like a really old man, and I guess he's 93, all hunched over and withered and sad, sad to see. Anyway, uh, so if you look at the very back of last week's handout, you see the list of kings going on there. Something weird is about to happen that's going to confuse everything. Uh, Ahab, is, Ahab is dead on the right-hand column. Ahaziah now, we're going to read a little bit about him. It's not going to last long. And then after Ahaziah, it says Joram. Now, look over on the left-hand side. Go to Jehoshaphat, which is the fourth one down from the top. And underneath him is Jehoram. Now, the Je Joram on the right-hand side is actually spelled exactly the same as Jehoram on the left-hand side. So there will be a weird point in history coming up shortly where both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom have different kings with the same name. It gets utterly confusing. Both reigning at the same time, which is even more confusing. So, all right, so let's look at the rest of 1 Kings 22 and then finish up. Uh, verse 51, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger according to all that his father had done. All right, now to the next handout, the new one for today. So Ahaziah's sin is compared to that of his father and mother. And this is the only time the sins of the mother are mentioned with regard to how the king followed in the previous sins. Which really goes to show the power and corruption of Jezebel. She, she really ran that northern kingdom during Ahab's reign. Ahab was serving her, answering to her. She set the tone. She was the spiritual leader of the northern kingdom. So she's mentioned here specifically because of her evil influence throughout the kingdom. All right, so uh, the first asterisk. Ahaziah becomes king in the year 553 B, or 553, 853 BC. Uh, the religion of the northern kingdom remains polytheistic under his short reign. 
and invoking Jeroboam's name shows that the golden calves, the false priesthood, the new liturgical calendar created by Jeroboam to supplant the worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem was still active and followed, which is 80 years after it was first enacted by Jeroboam. You know, how entrenched falseness can become. Even though everybody knew it was a made-up religion, they still all jumped on it and, it, and it caught, and it stayed. 80 years, it's still being practiced, along with all these other gods they've added to it. So they're thoroughly polytheistic, multiple gods. All right, now we go to 2 Kings, chapter 1, verse 1. Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. So if you look on your little map there on the handout, Moab is to the right of the Sea of Galilee. They're kind of isolated from Israel. And there's only this tiny little corner up in the northwest by Jericho where they really even touch the northern kingdom. So that had to have been where where the, the wars were going on. Moab simply rebels and refuses to pay uh, tribute anymore to the northern kingdom. So it looks like from this, both Edom and Moab were vassal states of Jerusalem, that is, or of Israel. So Israel and Judah controlled both of them and took tax money from them. That's what it was to be a vassal state. You paid taxes to the, your stronger neighbor so he didn't attack you. Uh, it looks like when the break happened between the two kingdoms that Judah remained controlled in control of Edom, but Israel took control of Moab as their vassal state. So Moab is sick of paying taxes to Israel. They see that Israel's king Ahab is dead that the kingdom is weakened, and they use that opportunity to say, we ain't paying you anything else. We're done with you. And, and wars, conflicts break out because of it. Verse 2. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured, so he sent messengers and said to them, go inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. It's a weird thing. He falls through a lattice in the upper, upper chamber. It doesn't say how, but it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very ignominious death, a very demeaning way to hurt yourself. He just did something stupid and fell through the window and seriously injured himself. And it's not like he gets to die in glory fighting the enemy. He dies falling out of a window because he did something stupid. So anyway, he wants, he wants his people to go inquire of Beelzebub, which sounds like Beelzebub for a reason. Uh, and just... Pure coincidence, our gospel reading this morning in church will have the only time in the New Testament where the word or the name Beelzebub is used. And that is when Jesus is casting out demons, somebody accuses him of casting them out by the power, using the power of Beelzebub, uh, which shows that in the first century, the name Beelzebub had become synonymous with Satan. So, Beelzebub, that we read about here, is kind of the forerunner of that New Testament understanding of the devil. The word Beelzebub, or Baal, Zebub, uh, literally means a god of flies. And he is, he is specifically the god worshipped in Ekron, which, are, which is a, a Philistine city. So he's a Philistine god. Uh, on the handout now, I've got a quote uh, that starts on the first page and goes on to the second. Uh, Beelzebub, name of the god of the Philistine city Ekron, mentioned only in connection with the illness of Ahaziah. 
when the sick monarch sent messengers to Ekron to consult him on the prospects of his recovery. There's been much speculation as to the character of the god. As the word stands, it means bale of flies. This is usually explained as the god who expels or destroys flies, though it may also mean patron or controller of flies. The two explanations may be combined into one, uh, or rather the second may include the first, for the god who has power to drive away any plague also has the power to send it. Of course, flies are also associated with death and rotting corpses. So there is something, there's something very fitting in the New Testament where they start calling Satan Beelzebub, which is basically, you know, the demon of flies. He's the death, the stench of death that attracts flies. Verse 3 to 4. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, um, is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Now, know therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. All right, so God, uh, God personally interacts with each pagan king of the northern kingdom Israel to remind them that he alone is a true God. Uh, though his sole interaction with Ahaziah is to announce his death, it did give Ahaziah the chance to hear from the true God and acknowledge him as such. So even though this is a, a judgment, one could still see this as God reaching out to him with giving him a chance. You know, if only he repents on his deathbed, God would still be gracious. God is coming to him in his deathbed, and he still won't hear it. Uh, it says here, the, uh, the angel of the Lord. You'll notice the word angel is a small a, but it could also be a capital A, uh, meaning this angel of the Lord could actually be the Lord. Because there are a couple of places in the Old Testament, you know, specifically in Genesis and Exodus, um, one of which is Moses in the burning bush where we are told this is the Lord speaking from the burning bush, but we're also told it is the angel of the Lord. So the word angel means messenger, the messenger of God, which in places in the Old Testament is the pre-incarnate Christ. So the angel of the Lord is Jesus, pre-incarnate. And this may be that angel again. This may be the pre-incarnate Christ talking to Elijah. The question given for Elijah to say is really a statement that Yahweh has not left Israel and is still the God of his people, even though the vast majority have abandoned him. So yeah, this question of, uh, you know, is, is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire in Baal? So obviously, there is a God in Israel, and why aren't you inquiring of him? Verses 5 to 8, when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, why have you come back? So he said to him, a man came up to meet us and said to us, go return to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there's no God in Israel that you're sending to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from your bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Then he said to them, what kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these words? So they answered him, he was a hairy man. And he wore a leather belt around his waist. And he said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. It's, again, almost comical. So the messengers didn't know who Elijah was. Uh, Ahaziah did because of Elijah's interactions with his dad, Ahab. And if you remember, Ahab told Je Jehoshaphat flat out he hated Elijah, just hated him. Uh, and he calls Elijah his enemy. So Ahaziah knows Elijah by reputation. And he had probably seen Elijah, too. Yeah. Uh, that's an area where he was born, or a town where he was born. Yeah. Uh, it also kind of goes to show Elijah was not a common fixture in the northern kingdom, because the messengers didn't know who he was. 
Uh, if he had been you know, kind of part of the king's court and was regularly coming in to talk to the king, everybody would have known who he was. He was hiding a lot, right. He had gone, he had left the northern kingdom to hide for his life. He spent three years in hiding from Jezebel. So yeah, he was, he was not in the northern kingdom often. Uh, the mark of God's prophet was this hairy mantle with the leather belt, which is exactly how John the Baptist dresses, which is also part of why the people in the New Testament thought John the Baptist was Elijah reincarnated, that God had raised Elijah back up from the dead because he looked just like him. And he was a, a wild man, essentially, hairy. You know, there's, there's two, two ways that word is used in Hebrew that I looked up. One is... It's the hair of animals, meaning the material you're wearing, which we know prophets wore a hairy mantle. So basically a cape of animal hair and then wrapped around with this leather belt. So that was what marked the prophet. So he was hairy in that sense. The word hairy is also used in the New Testament to describe somebody who's disheveled, who kind of looks like a mountain man. And I think that's probably what Elijah looked like, unkempt, Kind of a mountain man, disheveled, didn't comb his hair, you know, big bushy beard. He, was, he, he would have been quite the sight. You would have known him by, by, by seeing him, that's for sure. But his, his appearance says something theologically. It says that nothing else matters in life but God's word. That's all, that's all his whole life was, was serving God and speaking God's word. So he didn't waste time on the trappings of this life. He didn't worry about looking nice or wearing nice things or living in a nice home. He lived in the hills. He was a mountain man. He looked like a mountain man. So it's, it's all part of the, the message that this world doesn't matter. I bear God's word. That's the only thing that matters. And, and, and it's not, I don't think, it's, it's not like hermits, you know. It's kind of like a hermit, but it's not the same sense. Uh, like the, the hermits in Roman Catholicism, like St. Francis of Assisi, for example, that supposedly preached to animals and heard voices, which in my book kind of suggests schizophrenia. Uh, he was hearing voices and talking to animals. But if you say that to a Roman Catholic, it turns out they get quite offended by that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there's a story behind that, but I won't tell you. Um, hermits and, that isolate themselves in Catholicism are people who have disavowed themselves from the world and live their entire lives in isolation as a means of escaping the world. That is not what Elijah was doing. Elijah was still in the world, interacting with the world at the highest level, at the kings. But he had disavowed all material treasures. So he's not like the hermit's mentality of they have to keep themselves pure by isolating themselves from the world. His mentality is, I'm just serving God with everything I got, and I'll go wherever God wants me to go and say whatever he wants me to say. So it's a very different attitude than the, the venerated hermits of Catholicism. Uh, Elijah's no hermit, but he is a mountain man. All right, verses 12, 9 to 12. How are we doing time-wise? A little bit more. 9 to 12, then the king sent to him a captain of 50 men with his, uh, captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he went up to him, and there he was, sitting on top of a hill, and he spoke to him, man of God, the king said, has said, come down. So Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. Then he sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. And he answered and said to him, Man of God, thus uh, has the, the king said, Come down quickly. So Elijah answered and said to him, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. It's 
funny, when I, when I reread that for this, I had forgotten this story. It's been a while since I've read it. So the, the, the company of troops that are sent to Elijah are meant to intimidate him. 50 men. And this captain commands him. The king says, you will come. You, you don't mess with a prophet of the true God. So, yeah, there's the same miracle that happened on Mount Carmel with a fire from heaven that consumes the altar comes back down. That's kind of Elijah's mark. He bears the wrath of God in terms of fire from heaven. He's someone to be feared. So, bam, this, this fire hits all of these men and roasts them where they stand. And then another one comes, and he, the, the arrogance of this guy, he even adds to the first guy. This, this second guy says, come quickly, you know, commanding him even more urgently to obey the word of the king. This is not how one approaches God or his prophets, by commanding in the name of some wicked earthly king. So yeah, he gets toasted right there too. Which you'd think. I mean, if it were me, and you were sent to talk to a guy, and when you walked up to him and talked, here he is sitting on a hill, and there's like 50 dead bodies around him, and all the ground is black from fire. You'd think you'd have been a little more careful in how you address the guy. But then this guy comes in, and he's just as arrogant, just as boastful, and winds up dead. So now you've got 100 dead bodies around Elijah, charred black, and probably all the ground blackened all around. Everything burned, the grass, the trees. It's basically Elijah sitting in the middle of an ash heap of burned bodies. And here comes the next guy, 13 to 14. Uh, again, he sent a third captain of 50 with his 50 men. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said, Man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Look, fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of 50s with their 50s, but let my life now be precious in your sight. That's how you approach God. <laughs> Extreme reverence and humility. It's not even the king's troops anymore. The guy says, these servants of yours, totally surrendering himself before the prophet. That's how you approach God. You know, with this, this total self-emptying, uh, we're nothing before you and have no control over you at all, sort of a reverence. And, and God, in his mercy, then pardons him. Of course, <laughs> there was some pretty strong motivation since this God is kneeling in this ash heap with bodies all around him, probably right next to the other two captains' bodies that are now charred there. You, you can bet he was sweating bullets when he talked to Elijah. Uh, but he, he does, to his, to his credit, learn like the other guy before him didn't. All right, got to stop there. Any thoughts, comments, or questions? All right, we'll pick it up there next time. Let's close with prayer. Merciful Lord, we pray your blessings to grant us humility and reverence before you and to bless us for the sake of your Son, not for our own sakes. For Jesus' sake, amen.